This is Book TV's Afterwards podcast. This week, Bo Wise talks about the loss of his two brothers during the war in Afghanistan and his book, Three Wise Men, a Navy SEAL, a Green Beret, and how their Marine brother became a war's sole survivor. Wise and his co-author, Tom Saleo, are interviewed by journalist Kelly Kennedy. Well, welcome to you both, and thank you for speaking with me about your new book. I was really excited to read it and uh, glad to, to talk with you and ask you some questions today. Um, Bo, I was hoping you could tell me a little bit about what it was like to grow up with these two brothers and, and your sister Heather as well. Um, because of the age difference, it seems like you must have always felt like you had someone to sort of guide you. Yes, well, Jeremy, first of all, being uh, 10 years my senior, Ben, uh, um, he's so much bigger and so much larger, and Heather, our sister as well. So uh, you're absolutely right, the youngest of four, and we grew up in uh, rural South Arkansas, and it was uh, uh, just a really a very ideal childhood, very wholesome. And so, I, you know, Jeremy described it many times as pretty leave it to beaver. And uh, so it was, it was a great experience, and I wouldn't change my my childhood for the world, you know. You mentioned in the book, Bo, that you you grew up with a lot of, of heroes, of military heroes in your family, but not not in your immediate family. So right. when you guys were kids, were you playing Army? Were you playing, or Navy, or Marines? <laughs> what, what were you doing out in the woods? Well, the bug was there early, especially for Ben. Um, but for the most part, you know, we were more musicians, actually. Uh, uh, a lot of music, you know, playing in church and um uh, uh, we grew up in a, you know, the, the first school that we went to that all three of, you know, my brothers and sister graduated from didn't really have um, a big you know, music department. It was just a small little private school. And then we, we moved and um, I was the first one that got into band and jazz band and all the different outlets. And so all three encouraged me like, hey, this is cool. You've got access to a lot of stuff that we didn't have going to a public school. So that was kind of our influence early on. And, and I think music was a connection for all four of us, um, music and arts and things like that. Can you talk a little bit about the the people in your family who served? It sounds like your your mom would tell you bedtime stories about that when you were kids. Yeah, so a lot of the, uh, the military heritage really comes from my mom's family. Um, you know, her dad was uh, in the Army Air Corps before it became the Air Force in World War II. And he served and uh, her mother's brother, my great uncle, um, was a raider in the Pacific campaign. And he uh, um, was uh, received, had some kind of uh, head wound from, I, I, I think, Tarawa uh, or no, no, uh, Saipan, excuse me. And um, her great uncle, uh, my, my grandmother's uncle was um, uh, at Argonne Forest, and, and he was a Marine, like one of the original, uh, the, the Doughboys, Marine Doughboys that uh, earned the name uh, Tufelhunden. So the Marine legacy in our family goes way back, and it was pretty awesome for me joining uh, the Marine Corps, you know, it was about a century later and kind of connecting to that heritage. That was something that stuck out to me reading the book, too. You've got a sailor, a Marine, and a soldier, and I can't imagine, but that you guys had a lot of jokes going around about crayons and so on. So did you guys give each other a hard time about the different services? Well, no, you know, you don't uh, give a Navy SEAL too much grief, but uh, when when Ben was Army Infantry, uh, you know, and, and uh, I was aspiring to the Marine Corps when I was Marine Infantry later, and you know, his his roots were still Army Infantry, the Army grunt. So Ben and I had that rivalry and it was, you know, all in good fun, um, you know. And uh, but, yeah, it's, uh, you know, he would joke about uh, the equipment we use or whatever. And, you know, I, you know, say, hey, you know, you've got more Marine blood in you than you do anything else. Remember that, you know. Tom, can you tell me a little bit about how you two met, how you guys hooked up to, to do this project together? Sure, absolutely. And thanks for having us on, Kelly. And thank you for your service as well. Uh, Bo and I uh, met through a pretty unique set of circumstances. Um, I had started about 10 years ago uh, writing a, a blog and then a syndicated column about fallen heroes and veterans. And uh, one of the, the fallen heroes I wrote about was named Staff Sergeant Jesse Williams, 
and uh, he was killed in Iraq. Uh, but beforehand, he had served with Bo's brother, Ben, in Iraq on an infantry deployment. So I had connected with uh, Jesse's wife, Sonia, um, almost a decade earlier. And uh, when I did stumble on, on the Wise family story and obviously wanted to know more about it, uh, it was Sonia who put me in touch with Ben's widow, Tracy. And then Tracy uh, and I talked and then she put me in touch with Bo and it all went from there. And I'm, I'm so honored to play a small part in helping Bo tell this story. Uh, one of my favorite and least favorite things about telling stories, um, servicemen versus stories, is that when you're working with someone who's been through a traumatic experience, um, there are times when your, your heart is breaking as they tell the story, but at the same time, you're wondering if it's helping to tell the story, like if you're leading them through something. Um, so I'm wondering, Tom, if there's there were things that you did intentionally to help guide Bo through the, the trauma of this, of telling the story. Sure. Well, um, I've had the honor of uh, interviewing more than 100 Gold Star family members. I've worked on, on some with books and uh, with veterans as well. And uh, the most important thing I try to do is go into each story with no preconceived notions whatsoever. Everybody grieves differently. Everybody handles it differently. Uh, but with Bo, you know, when we first met, I flew to Oklahoma and we sat down and, and talked and um, right away, I think things clicked. And, you know, there were times where Bo said, hey, hey man, this is just too much. Uh, I need to step back. And the minute he said that, I said, I got it and, and took over and I was happy to do it. Um, honored to do it. And, uh, you know, but I, I have to say the bravery that Bo has shown, not only as a Marine and a Gold Star brother, but in being willing to open these wounds and explore and learn more about his brothers and tell the world about them. I have so much admiration for the courage he's showing by doing this. And Bo, kind of the, the reverse question is you were working through your brother's deaths and in, in talking with Tom, were there, were there moments when you just didn't want to do this anymore? Did this feel like it was cathartic and, and something that was helpful for you? Um, you know, as Tom said, that's, you know, that was uh, the moment where it was just absolutely set in stone that I absolutely got the right co-author when, um, and I kind of hated doing that to him. And I, there was times that I, you know, I, I, fought this far and I'm going to keep fighting it. And, you know, and I, I knew that we were, we had to get through this and we had to, to, to finish it once and for all and preserve Jeremy and Ben's legacy. But there were absolutely moments where I just did not, you know, I, I couldn't do it. I, I needed to, to grieve to myself and, you know, uh, just alone or, or with my wife or whatever. But, um, you know, when dealing with Green Berets and Navy SEALs and, you know, sometimes the uh, information would just come and then come to a, an abrupt stop. And then sometimes it would just pour out. And then after a while, you you feel so taxed emotionally. Um, but having uh, someone like Tom to, to work with was uh, a lifesaver because I, you know, I, even though I didn't like doing that to him, I had to just step away. And what was the the moment where you felt like you needed to do this project? What, what inspired you to tell your story, your brother's story? You know, I started uh, journaling as kind of an outlet um, many years ago. And um, it, I found that it was easier uh, to write. And um, the, uh, the journal entries that were uncovered was just a few, and they make a very, very, very small percentage of the book. Um, you know, but it gave, I think, Tom and I just kind of an idea of, of where we wanted to go. So, you know, I didn't share them with him right away when he told me his vision and our, our plan just kind of synced. And I thought there's a lot of things that I want to say. And he's, you know, feeding it back to me without me telling him anything about it. So I said, you know, I've, I've uncovered a, a few journal entries that were lost and tell me what you think. And he said, yeah, he said, let's let's use this as kind of. Um, and I, I think it was just where we started the uh, 
uh, the proposal uh, for the book. And, but, you know, talking about Jeremy and Ben in their last moments is as rough as I knew it was going to be the fact that he wanted to focus on Jeremy and Ben's goal of preservation of life, not just taking life. And we say things like that as Marines, SEALs, Green Berets all the time, and probably in an effort to you know, desensitize ourselves, but the end status is uh, to be there, you know, brothers and sisters left and right. And they did that every day of their lives. How did your family respond when you said you wanted to work on this, your, your wife and your, your dad and your mom? There was a, uh, a lot of caution. There was a um, um, hesitation, I think uh, um, a little bit of fear, you know, if I'm being honest, because uh, we, you know, it was uh, between uh, the article in the Washington Post uh, from Ian Shapiro, who did a great job, a uh, fantastic job years ago, uh, Triple Agent by Joby Warwick, uh, Zero Dark Thirty, you know, all of that stuff. I mean, I think the family had finally was coming to a point where things had calmed down and we were starting to heal. So I think everybody was worried about, you know, feeling the scab, so to speak. Um, and, uh, but for me, it was something that um, I felt that absolutely had to do. And I, I just told all the family members, look, I understand. The, for those that were hesitant, I said, I understand. If, if you don't want to be involved, that's fine. Uh, if there's something that you want to say, you know, you can reach out to myself or Tom anytime, of course, and we'll be uh, happy to include it and, you know, get your heart into this book as well. So, and there was a lot of that from, from Green Berets and families. This isn't just my story. This is the story of a lot of veterans and wise family and wise family friends. And, um, you know, so it's a collaboration of you know, so much effort from so many people that just wanted to preserve that legacy. And then Tom, if I can ask you a question, how did you guys report this out? I mean, you're working with Green Beret and a Navy SEAL, so a lot of their, their um, story was not available. How did you kind of work backward on this? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there was a tremendous amount of research for this book uh, more than any other book I've worked on. And, and that's saying something because there's been some, you know, a lot of research in those books too. But when you're dealing with, you know, two special operations warriors, more than 1600 combined days in combat between Ben, Jeremy and Bo and over a decade long period, you can only imagine how many different people they served with, how many lives they touched, how many people they saved. So we just really wanted to talk to anyone who was willing. Um, we weren't able to talk to, to everyone. A lot of that actually is because in the case of the Navy SEALs, especially there were multiple guys deployed uh, while we were writing the book. Although some of them to their infinite credit actually called me from the war zones. And uh, I'm just so appreciative. And, and of course, those we weren't able to speak to, I completely understand, but this book could not have been written without the help of those SEALs, those Green Berets, the infantry soldiers who served with Ben all the way back in 0304 in Iraq. And then of course, those family members and their friends. Uh, this book is for them. And they just did a tremendous job helping us and they continue helping us to this day to spread the word. Do you guys do those interviews together? Uh, most of the time, it, it was me. Bo did definitely uh, do several of them. Uh, there was that time where, you know, things were getting a little bit emotional. And uh, particularly with the Green Berets, I, I conducted most of those. But, um, you know, right after, I would, I would text him or call him and, and let him know how they went. And then, of course, Bo knows many of these, these Green Berets and SEALs personally. And and he texted and talked to them as well. So it was really a mutual effort and uh, everyone pitched in all the way through. So Bo, were there things that surprised you as you were reporting this out? I imagine because of what your brother's jobs were, there were things they couldn't tell you along the way. Were there, were there things as you were writing that just 
surprised you about your brothers? I was surprised by a lot of things. Um, Particularly, uh, I think the first surprise is when uh, Tom started uh, interviewing a lot of SEALs and he relayed a lot of information to me as far as the kinetic nature of Jeremy's deployments, particularly, first of all. And um, there was a now they there was things that probably a lot of which I don't remember because it was years ago, nearly uh, over a decade ago. But um, once they realized that I was dead set on the Marine Corps, that I was absolutely convinced I'm going Marine Corps, I'm going infantry. And, you know, then the information started to come in. Uh, but so there, it, as far as lessons learned and uh, whatever they could share with me to equip me, they would. But a lot, you're right, a lot of personal things and uh, the kinetic nature of Jeremy's deployments, uh, the way that Ben responded to grief uh, shocked me. Um, and we didn't talk about that when, uh, you know, when I'm in Afghanistan, Ben's team is in Afghanistan and he's home on paternity leave because his son Luke was born. Jeremy was in Coast Province, Afghanistan. So when everything happened with um, at Fob Chapman and I flew home and met Ben stateside and linked up with the family. And then we uh, did the memorial service and then very quickly Ben and I went back to Afghanistan. I did not respond to grief well at all. And I'm not proud of the way that I responded to it, but it was, it's the truth. And, it, and I, you know, I wanted to be honest and I wanted people to see that contrast and knowing how well Ben responded to grief and kind of encouraged me to be honest, because I think it's important for the reader to, I mean, two blood brothers, hundred percent blood brothers that are personality wise, very alike can respond to grief so differently. And I was a, a raw emotion going you know, back to Afghanistan and Ben uh, responded by diving into his faith and trying to you know, protect his soul in every way and i thought that you know as tom and i dug into it I said did you know ben was doing he or he asked me he said did you know ben was um hosting bible studies and doing all these things to just keep himself on an even keel and i said no no he never talked about it and then, um and even when uh that that particular deployment was over and i went to washington you know it was not it wasn't something he boasted about he was just humble in nature and, um tried to pass what he could to to keep me sharp as well. Is that something that happened when you were kids too, or was this something that, that was new? Uh, what, do you, what do you mean? I'm sorry. Oh, sure. Uh, the, the way he fell back on his, his faith, was that something he would have expected based on how he was when you were kids or is this? He, he was, he, he was, uh, he's a very, very spiritual person and he was a, uh, uh, spiritual intellectual and um, he was kind of he and Jeremy both kind of inspired me to like a, um, Christian apologetic works from an early age C.S. Lewis and uh, Dr. Robbie Zacharias and others um, so I mean and and that was and that was our father really um, you know inspired kind of all of us that way it was a very very uh, you know Christian religious household um, but Ben I would say carried that most if not all of his life i i think um of the three brothers ben is the only one that never deterred in faith in any way um jeremy and i both had our, our moments of you know where we you know asking the big picture questions agnostic but yeah ben was very very driven faith wise some of the things in the book remind me of, you know, typical grunt level conversation, you know, they won't let me do my job and I just want to go out and, you know, knock down doors instead of the, the Petraeus counterinsurgency <clears throat> model of building hearts and minds and, and that sort of thing. One of the things that struck me as interesting in the book was, excuse me, one of the things that struck me as interesting in the book was that, um, you presented your brothers as as brothers, like there there's a seal and there's there's a, a green beret, but for you they may have been heroes, sort of small, like brothers small, but but you presented them as very human. Was that a conscious decision for you guys to to present them that way, or do you did you realize you were you were doing that? Well, that was something that Tom encouraged me to do early on, and though I mean they were. I mean, I idolized them uh, from a very early age, both of them. 
Um, and Tom said, you know, don't be afraid to to let them be human. And I, I instantly, I like that sentiment of, you know, letting people like relate to them, not, you know, even as great as they were, you know, they were human and they had faults and, um, and getting into that, I think was, was very important. It, it helped me connect to them um, after the fact as well. So, um, so I, I was really grateful to, to have Tom there as far as that, you know, that was concerned, you know, where I would, you know, I, I, I would tend to, I think naturally left to my own devices, I would fluff, you know, them as characters in the book. And, um, and uh, not that Tom wanted to, to downplay you know, them as the heroes they were, but just wanted to make sure that, you know, um, that, that I made them as, you know, human as possible and say, you know, the good and the bad. And this is why they're such amazing people and, and heroes that deserve to be remembered. And why was that so important to you, Tom? Probably based on your previous experience as, a, as an author and with the Gold, Gold Star families. Sure, that's part of it. Uh, absolutely. Um, I, I think this is not just a military book. I think it's about you know, two young men who could have done anything that they wanted in life and they chose to save other lives and dedicate as much of themselves as they possibly could to, to protecting other people. And, and they're not the only characters in the story, Jeremy and Ben, uh, their families are a huge part of this. And I really wanted to help show the country, not just what the men and women on the ground sacrifice, but what their families go through. Uh, you may have noticed we included some uh, AOL instant messenger, if anyone remembers AIM from the old days, uh, messages between uh, Ben and Tracy while Ben was deployed. And, and it shows them not talking about just missing each other, but, you know, hey, uh, Tracy says, hey, I got to get something fixed at the house. How do, how do I do it? Just the everyday things that couples go through. And then, of course, you know, while Tracy's raising their son, Luke. Um, so I, I hope this book gives a window into that sacrifice and that it won't just appeal to the military community where, of course, we want the military community to embrace the story and hope they will. But I think everyday Americans as well, just to get that sense of what these men and women, women are willing to sacrifice on a daily basis. And this one's for you, Bo. There was a point where all three of you were deployed at the same time to Afghanistan. And as Ham was saying, you, you went into what that, how that affected the family, but, but the day to day, how that affects the family, not having, you know, one of three uncles around or, or, or being worried at, at all moments for the a family member. Um, was that something you understood before you went or was that something that, that it took deploying to really, really get a handle on how it would affect your family? I, I think it, I think you're right. It, it took a deployment to, to really, truly, fully appreciate what it was like. And um, not even the first deployment. I, to this day, I have no idea what it's like to be deployed as a father or a mother. That, in my opinion, I, I being a father now, looking back, it's like, man, you know, it was it was difficult enough as a, as a husband, which was my second deployment. Uh, but the first deployment, I, I you know, it. <laughs> you're young and bulletproof and you're, you're, you know, if something happens, you don't really think about it so much, you know, when you're, if you haven't been exposed to that kind of moral danger before. Um, so I uh, think now looking back at how many deployments that they did as, as fathers just is kind of staggering to me. So they, I, I think you're right early on. I probably didn't appreciate it. There was another thing that struck out or stuck out to me in the book was, you know, you're in Afghanistan, your brothers are there too, and you expect to see them. Like, like they're going to pop up on a base or something and you're going to, you're going to see them. Um, is that just sort of a, a note towards your na naivety as you're going into Afghanistan as to what that experience was going to be like? It, it was, and I didn't, a lot of that, and I did kind of wonder, like, I wonder if there's any chance whatsoever of, of me getting close to, to Jeremy. And I did not know that um, 
I knew that that Luke was when Luke was born. I think I found out, or I may not have known. I, I actually I don't remember. It's been so long, but um, I remember wondering, um, you know, if if I knew that Jeremy was there, I didn't know where, and I knew that Ben would be on his way soon, and so I I was just kind of wondering, you know, like if, what are the odds. And then eventually it did happen, um, you know, under bad circumstances when Jeremy and, uh, had passed and Ben and I, we came home for the memorial service uh, because he was not active duty, because he wasn't um, uh, working directly for the Central Intelligence Agency. Unfortunately, he did not, uh, he, he was not allowed to be buried at Arlington, which was a fight that the family took up early on. We, we thought maybe we should. And, and later on, we just said, you know what? Um, maybe Jeremy would just prefer to be very close to home. So we settled with that. But on the way, once we finally did get um, Jeremy buried in Virginia uh, and we found out that it was going to happen and we were going to fly home for the funeral. And Ben and I, of course, bumped into each other in Kuwait, literally physically bumped into each other. And uh, so it's, you know, it's, it's a small, it's a small world, but it's a much, much smaller shooter world. So, um, yeah, I, I, not knowing that Jeremy was CIA early on, I didn't know what the odds were. And I just kind of, but it was always in the back of my mind. Were you surprised when Jeremy decided to to leave the SEALs? That had been such a big dream for him. Yeah, I was. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think, um, you know, with, with the, the culture and the, the climate just changes and, uh, I think he was just ready for a change to move on something else. And, um, but I, I, uh, I think that his aspirations were for, uh, you know, maybe I, I don't really know why, you know, we honestly, now that you mention it, um, I didn't really get a chance to talk to him because, uh, when, um, once I enlisted, that was the last time with the three of us would never be together again, uh, in the same place at the same time. So, and then everything was coming. I didn't even get to to uh, to go to Ben's wedding, and we were in Twenty Nine Palms, I believe, and I think in Twenty Nine Palms at Mojave Viper, getting uh, it was the last phase for another deployment. So there was a lot of things that I missed, and a lot of conversations missed that I still think about today. And I got to say, that's probably one of. Them. So he was working security for the CIA. Is that is that what you guys surmised from? Yes. Uh, call it GRS, I believe it's a global response, um, the same type of job as you saw in uh, uh, the book 13 Hours, um, the, the guys that, that work for um, the Central Intelligence Seat, but they're not organic or indigenous work, you know, to that specific uh, team. So his death was was part of a national conversation there for a minute. I'm not sure which one of you would feel more comfortable talking about that, but those details were so muddy and you guys talk about that extensively in the book, just how, how kind of unusual that was. Was that a difficult part of the book to um, report out and, and relive and, and decipher? Uh, for me, that was something I wanted to talk about a lot and, um, and, not not really to, to throw anyone under the bus, so to speak, but just kind of, um, you know, the, I, I think my frustration then and looking back going through this, and this is where, where I, I think we got clarification in writing the book and Tom just, we just kind of got to understand a little bit better. And, you know, when, when the information is coming back, you don't want to give a family partial information. You don't want to allow them to speculate in any way. And so, the, the, although it was frustrating for me early on, especially in you know in, in early 2010, when Ben and I were having these conversations, of why can't they tell us if you know where the explosion occurred? Did it happen inside the pub or outside the pub? You know, you you but you don't even want to give a family member 99% of the information. You wait until you have 100, and then you give it. And so, knowing what I know now, I I, I think and uh, and this is. I, I think uh, due to working with Tom and Tom being as thorough as he is and like putting all the pieces together and getting clarification. Can you tell us about what happened there? What, what, what pieces you did put together from that experience? Like I said, it was such a national story. Can you kind of go over what happened? 
Sure. And I, I vividly remember uh, hearing about it. It was uh, December 30th, 2009, a very key moment in the hunt for Osama bin Laden directly tied to that. And uh, just to give you the shorter version, um, the CIA was was duped by Al Qaeda, uh, despite, you know, the heroes of the CIA being involved. It was, um, you know, an, an intelligence, um, I guess, uh, you know, one of those things that can happen in intelligence. And there's been exhaustive investigations of it you know, to make sure that that's something like that's never able to happen again. But uh, the person that I have to credit uh, so heavily for helping us in this area is a Pulitzer Prize winning Washington Post reporter, Joe B. Warwick, who wrote an exhaustively researched book called The Triple, the Triple Agent, excuse me. And uh, we connected with Joe B. pretty early. Bo had connected with him uh, before I had met Bo. And uh, right away, Joe B. said, you know, he would help in any way he could. Um, graciously let us use excerpts from his book and our book. And uh, if you read The Triple Agent, it goes through the entire history, which really is so closely tied to, to one of the key moments in the war on terror that eventually helped lead to Navy SEALs, Jeremy's fellow Navy SEALs killing Osama bin Laden. So what did happen that day? What was, what was the, the series of, like, very briefly, what, what happened that led to this investigation? And it was uh, on Fob Chapman in Coast Province, Afghanistan, December 30th, 2009. And um, the, the man that they thought was a CIA double agent who had infiltrated Al Qaeda was at, this was plotted the whole time by Al Qaeda. Um, you know, if you read Joby Warwick's reporting, um, there are strong suspicions that uh, Ayman al Zawahiri, Al Qaeda's number two, was personally involved in this plot. And uh, it was a suicide bombing. Uh, nine total uh, were killed, seven CIA heroes, including Jeremy. I believe it was the deadliest day for the CIA uh, since Beirut in the 80s. So uh, just an absolute tragedy and, and we mourn for their families as well. And Bo, that's why it was so important to you to find out whether it was on the FOB or off the FOB. Yes, and, and, and uh, it, although it came out years ago, um, I, I thought it was important and I think Tom thought it was important too, like his, you know, you get kind of frustrated in the moments of grief and it's easy to point the finger at um, the guy that was giving us this information just, you know, and Ben and I, when we were in Dover, looked like an operator. I mean, he looked like, uh, you know, someone you would see downrange and I could see the, you know, his heart breaking. I could see it in his eyes like he just wanted to pour his heart out to us. Uh, but he just did not. I, I, I know in hindsight. I know that he just did not want to make the mistake of giving us uh, partial information and just making that mistake. I noticed the book is nonpartisan. It, it felt like you made a, a big effort to include voices from all sides, especially in, in the, the names of people who were uh, offering co um, condolences or compassion to your family. Was that something that you guys talked about or did that just come about naturally? Uh, yes, um, uh, it was an effort, um, you know, for a story like this one, uh, I don't think it's political in any way, but regardless of what I think, it came naturally. Um, you know, Jeremy and Ben and Bo were deeply inspired as we write in the book by um, the speech President Bush gave to joint session of Congress after 9-11. And and the unity that the country felt in that moment, partially, Ben was already in the military, but certainly drove Jeremy in a lot of ways to leave medical school bravely and become a Navy SEAL. And then as you move through the story, of course, President Bush leaves office, President Obama takes over, and the kindness that President Obama showed those seven CIA families, he gave a speech at Langley with uh, then CIA director Leon Panetta and uh, personally reached out to the families, including the Wises. And then when Ben was killed, 
just over two years later, you'll see in the book, there's a, a handwritten note from Secretary Panetta, who, by the way, uh, helped us and, and gave us a, a beautiful endorsement for this book. Uh, you can tell the Wise family story means a lot to Secretary Panetta. And so there are Republicans and Democrats and independents throughout this story. And I think what it teaches us is it's so much bigger than what divides us, what the military sacrifices. And it's something that all Americans can unite on and be proud of what our armed forces are willing to do for us. One of the things that's always been important to me is this idea that as a, a nation, if we vote for war as a, as a community, we should be there to listen to those stories when people come home. So I appreciate that in, intensely. Um, Bo, you said when your, your brother arrived at Dover, another family member hugged you and, and asked you to kill, to kill them all. What was your response at that moment? And, and how do you feel about that now? Like, it was such an in the moment thing to say, so. Right, uh, from one grieving member, uh, grieving family member to the other at the time, it made perfect sense, you know. I, I was, like I said, I did not respond to grief very well at all. And um, my combat experience was minimal in, 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 in retrospect. Um, that was a blessing. It's a good thing that I, I think that I never had one time, at one time ever I had to pull my trigger um, overseas. And I'm, I was very angry about that one, at one point in time, but, um, and it was, you know, my, my first deployment, it was kind of a joke. I mean, I, or at one point in time, my platoon guys uh, thought that I was uh, good luck or bad luck, whatever you want to call it. You know, they would put me on whatever patrol was going west towards Marja, like, you know, it's gonna happen, dude, don't worry about it. And, but it's a good thing that I didn't. Um, and it's a good thing that it didn't ever happen for me. You know, call it luck, blessing, you know, whatever, um, whatever it was, I'm grateful for it. But I, I think yeah, probably everyone in that room, um, the family members for the CIA seven was probably their heart and their mind was in that place at one point. And if there is one thing that I can share with them, it's, it's you know, that uh, it doesn't settle your heart any. And I, I learned that just from Ben's teachings, you know, that there's uh, don't chase the fight. And I had many Marine Corps mentors that told me that don't chase it. You know, be careful what you wish for. You just might get it. I know the book has only been out for a minute, but have people reached out to you since since it's come out to, to tell you more stories or to to comment on what you've seen or what they, they read. Yes, Look, yes, Tom. there has. We've had a, sorry, go ahead, Tom. No, Tom, go ahead. Thanks, Bo, sorry about that. Uh, yes, countless family members have reached out. Actually, I was just messaging yesterday with the brother of one of the CIA heroes killed and he got the book and he's gonna be connecting with Bo shortly. Um, so it's just been, you know, there's nothing more important to us than that. Bo, you've had to address many levels of guilt through this this book, from from not being home when when your brother was killed, to uh, leaving your battle buddies behind when your brother was killed, to um, it being pulled entirely from from the battle, and it it led you to a dark place. Can you tell us a little bit about what your journey has been since then? Because that's that's a moment, you know, when maybe you can describe a little bit about what happened that night and, and where you've come since then. Um, you know, I, I think that you just articulated it very well. I think the survivor's guilt compounded for that reason because of multiple instances where I, um, being away from my Marines for, for two weeks at a time, I felt guilty every day. And I, I was up at night, just about every night while I was gone, thinking about them and like praying to God that no one got hurt while I was absent. And so, and as we talked about in the book, getting back to them, I was just such a relief. And it was like one of the best feelings in the world. And uh, the, the, my oldest friend in the Marine Corps was on post. And I, one of the first places I went, I said, where's Johnson? They said, he's up on post. I, said, I went and climbed the ladder and ran up there. And, uh, you know, having the response and like being, as crazy as it sounds, it felt like uh, 
um, just as good as going home in so many ways. You know, the, the relief was gone. And so I, I think leaving the Marine Corps or leaving the infantry or being non-deployable or restricted from Victor units or deployable units, uh, it was like the guilt came back. And so I, I struggled for, for many years with it, you know, doing instructor jobs, even though I stayed in the Marine Corps, um, just doing kind of odds and ends things and things that I didn't sign up for. You know, I signed up for belt fed ammunition. And so I, I felt robbed and, and um, like a lesser Marine in, in some ways. It really made me, you know, and it, it started me on a downward spiral. And, and eventually it's, it's going to, you know, that kind of thinking is going to, uh, I think of, of eventually it'll become something that's just a self-pity where you just feel sorry for yourself. And once you, once you get to that point, it's, that's where it's going to start accelerating real quickly. And, and then, you know, in those, in those moments on, on the, where, where you're talking about the scene, where you're talking about towards the conclusion is, um, you know, I thought about a lot of things and I thought about Ben who, you know, suffered with, you know, the wounds that he did eight to 10 rounds in chest, legs and groin. And when the amputations were up to hip to the hip and he was still um, fighting for every last breath. And I just, you know, said, Ben's going to fight for every impossible breath. And you're, you're looking at this option and uh, just, and that's when, you know, Jeremy and Ben's last moments, their legacy and everything that they, that they did. And I was, it just made me feel like, no, this is not going to be it. And you're going to keep going and you're going to fight. You know, if Ben can fight, then I can fight. And I'll keep fighting. Are there things you've done since then that help to, to carry through it? Yeah, there's a lot of things. And, and one is, you know, trying to, uh, in, in, Ben's example, trying to, you know, get back into my faith and uh, stop blaming God uh, for me personally. I mean, I'm a Christian, so that's something that's, um, but whatever your faith is, you know, just getting grounded and, and making sure that you're taking care of, of yourself, heart, mind, and soul. And and then, you know, you know, we, we say in the Marine Corps, you know, uh, there is no such thing as an ex-Marine, just, you know, former active. And, you know, reconnecting with that family, like, uh, during this book writing process, it's helped me exponentially because I'm, you know, doing the research for this. Now I have, you know, reconnected to that entire uh, platoon almost all, but just a few guys I've found. And now we have like, you know, a couple of 20 member text chains and, we, you know, we just annoy each other. And that little stuff right there, just steel sharp and steel and staying connected. And then Tom, you probably have, have done some guiding there as well. Just that, that part of the, the story. Uh, imagine that that was a, a tough interview that day. Um, as a writer, were there things that you did for yourself to, to kind of help yourself through the, the writing of something that's a, a traumatic story? Sure, absolutely. Um, you know, I'm not gonna lie, it kept me up many nights as well. And I, I still think about it. Um, this story and, and a lot of the previous stories that I've had the honor of being, you know, helping others tell, uh, you know, I think a lot about Ben. Um, I think about Jeremy too, of course, but I think a lot about what Ben did have knowing that his brother had already passed away. His big brother went back for multiple deployments um, away from his family, away from Tracy, away from young Luke, Ryan and Kalen, and was willing to do that and fought so hard while he was there and, and saved so many lives, including, you know, just hours before he was shot, minutes, in fact. And then to battle so hard after he had been wounded for six days in the hospital. And I think about uh, his wife, Tracy, and Bo flying to Germany and being with him in his final moments. And those are not things that you can easily put out of your mind. And frankly, I don't want to put them out of my mind because it's a reminder for a civilian like me of what someone I've never met was willing to do to protect my family and other families like mine. You two have developed a friendship through this, even going to uh, a Nats game and uh, your, your daughter was named in, in honor of the Nats. Um, can, can you talk about what that was like? I mean, was it trepidatious at first or was it, is it 
you know, like instant, you said you clicked instantly, but it did it feel that way or how did that progress? Right away, uh, we hit it off immediately. I think, you know, we had a couple beers in Oklahoma when I went down there and, and it was like, you know, we had known each other for years. Then we went to Virginia, my home state, and uh, started out in Northern Virginia um, doing some research. And we went to that, that Nationals game and then uh, went down to Virginia Beach area to pay respects uh, to Ben and Jeremy where they're buried in Suffolk. And then, you know, you mentioned the, the Nationals and not to get sidetracked with baseball, but you know, we went to that game and then um, it was a few months later that my wife and I learned uh, that she was pregnant, but also that our daughter has Down syndrome. And one of the first people I called was Bo. And he was right there for me every step of the way. And I will always be so grateful to him. And I'm so honored and proud to call him a friend. Are there questions that you still would like to have at answer just really, really quickly? We're wrapping up here. You know, uh, there was, I, I, we found out so much. I mean, I, I think that Tom and I, we could probably made this book 500 pages uh, if, you know, there was room, but, um, and, and like you said earlier, you know, the Green Berets and SEALs and, uh, guys from his infantry unit, contractors, you know, we get phone calls and um, I don't, I don't have social media. So anything from, from those outlets goes through Tom and he's, Hey, you know, this guy reached out and we're still learning so much, you know, all the time. And, and it's, um, I would not do it again. <laughs> like it was very cathartic and painful, but very rewarding. And we're still, um, you know, getting rewarded each and every day by learning more and more about Jeremy and Ben as more and more people reach out to us. And it's, um, you know, like, yeah, I, I really, uh, I, I think I'm done asking questions for a while. <laughs> and then what is the response Ben? Have you, you've heard, uh, back from, from people since the book has come out? The response has been unbelievable. It's been overwhelming. We're so grateful to everyone, uh, Gold Star families uh, that I know, but then other Gold Star families have, as well have reached out and said, you know, this story means a lot to me. It gives me a voice, even though it's not about my loved one. Um, and then again, there are people reaching out every day that we didn't get to talk to while we were working on the book. In fact, uh, one of the um, the airborne guys who was with Ben on one of his final flights in Afghanistan, uh, giving him medical care, reached out and said, you know, told me what he did and, and said he'd never forget Ben. And he's always been praying for the wise family. And of course I relayed that to Bo immediately. So it's just been such a special and overwhelming response. And, uh, and I think it's, it's worthy of the wise family's sacrifice. Thank you both for talking with me. I enjoyed reading the book. If enjoyed, it's not the right word, but but enjoyed learning your story and, and hearing more about that place and time. Um, and, and good luck with your lunch. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you, Kelly. And thank you for your service again. And yes, thank you. Thanks for listening to this week's Afterwards podcast. Subscribe, rate, and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Send us an email at podcasts at c-span.org.